Some years ago, I had just given a talk on television in Canada when one of the announcers came up to me and said, you know, if one can believe that this universe is in charge of an intelligent and beneficent God, don't you think he would naturally have provided us with an infallible guide to behavior and to the truth about the universe? And of course, I knew he meant the Bible. I said, no, I think nothing of the kind, because I think a loving God would not do something to his children that would rot their brains. Because if we had an infallible guide, we would never think for ourselves. And therefore, our minds would become atrophied. It is as if my grandfather had left me a million dollars. I'm glad he didn't. And we have, therefore, to begin any discussion of the meaning of the life and teaching of Jesus with a look at this thorny question of authority, and especially the authority of Holy Scripture. Because in this country in particular, there are an enormous number of people who seem to believe that the Bible descended from heaven with an angel in the year 1611, which was when the so-called King James, or more correctly authorized version of the Bible, was translated into English. Now, the question of authority needs to be understood because I am not going to claim any authority in what I say to you except the authority, such as it is, of history. And that's a pretty uncertain authority. But from my point of view, the four Gospels are, I think, to be regarded on the whole as historical documents. Uh, I'll even grant the miracles. Because speaking as one heavily influenced by Buddhism, we are not very impressed by miracles. The traditions of Asia, Hindu, Buddhist, Taoist, and so forth, are full of miraculous stories. And we take them in our stride. We don't think that there are any sign of anything in particular except psychic power. And we in the West have, by scientific technology, accomplished things uh, of a very startling nature. We could blow up the whole planet, and uh, Tibetan magicians have never promised to do anything like that. And I'm really a little scared of the growing interest in psychic power, because that's what I call psychotechnics. And so we've made such a mess of things with ordinary techniques that heaven only knows what we might do if we got hold of psychotechnics and started raising people from the dead and prolonging life insufferably and uh, doing everything we wished. I mean, the whole answer to the story of miracles is simply imagine that you're God and that you can have anything you want. Well, you'd have it for quite a long time. And then after a while, you say, this is getting pretty dull because I know in advance everything that's going to happen. And so you would wish for a surprise. And you would find yourself this evening in this church as a human being. So, I mean, that, that is the, the miracle thing. I think miracles are probably possible. That doesn't bother me. And as a matter of fact, when you read the writings of the early fathers of the church, the great theologians like St. Clement, Gregory of Nyssa, St. John of Damascus, even Thomas Aquinas, they're not interested in the historicity of the Bible. They take that sort of for granted, but forget it. They're interested in its deeper meaning. And therefore, they always interpret all the tales like Jonah and the whale. They, they don't bother even to doubt whether Jonah was or was not swallowed by a whale or other big fish. But they see in the story of Jonah and the whale a prefiguration of the resurrection of Christ. And then even when it comes to the resurrection of Christ, they're not worrying about the chemistry or the physics of a risen body. What they're interested in is that the idea of the resurrection of the body has something to say about the meaning of the physical body in the eyes of God. That the physical body, in other words, is not something worthless and unspiritual, 
but something which is an object of the divine love. And so, therefore, I'm not going to be concerned with whether or not miraculous events happened. It seems to me entirely beside the point. So I regard the four Gospels as, on the whole, as good a historical document as anything else we have from that period, including the Gospel of St. John. Now, what about then the authority of these scriptures? Uh, we could take this problem in two steps. A lot of people don't know how we got the Bible at all. We Westerners got the Bible thanks to the Catholic Church. The Catholic Church and members of the Church wrote the books of the New Testament. And they took over the books of the Old Testament, which even by the time of Christ had not been finally decided upon by the Jews. The Jews did not close the canon of the Old Testament until the year 100 AD or thereabouts at the Synod of Jamnia. And then they finally decided which were the canonical books of the Hebrew Scriptures and embodied them in the Masoretic text, the earliest copy of which dates from the 10th century, early in the 10th century AD. The books to be included in the New Testament were not finally decided upon until the year 382 AD again at the Synod of Rome under Pope Damasus. So it was the Church, the Catholic Church, that promulgated the Bible and said, we are giving you these scriptures on our authority and by the authority of the informal tradition that has existed among us from the beginning, inspired by the Holy Spirit. So you receive historically the Bible on the Church's say-so. And the Catholic Church insists, therefore, that the Church, collectively, speaking under the presumed guidance of the Holy Spirit, has the authority to interpret the Bible. And you can take that or leave it. So, if the Church says the Bible is true, it finally comes down to you. Are you going to believe the Church or aren't you? If nobody believes the Church, it will be perfectly plain, won't it, that the Church has no authority. Because the people is always the source of authority. That's why de Tocqueville said that a people gets what government it deserves. And so, you may say, well, God himself is the authority. Well, how are we to show that? That's your opinion. Well, you say, well, you wait and see. The day of judgment is coming. And then you'll find out who's the authority. Yes, but at the moment, uh, th th there is no evidence for the day of judgment. And it remains, until there is evidence, simply your opinion that the Day of Judgment is coming. And there is nothing else to go on, except the opinion of other people who hold the same view and whose opinions you bought. So really, I won't deny anybody's right to hold these opinions. You may indeed believe that the Bible is literally true and that it was actually dictated by God to Moses and the prophets and the apostles. That may be your opinion, and you are at liberty to hold it. I don't agree with you. I do believe, on the other hand, that there is a sense in which the Bible is divinely inspired. But I mean by inspiration something utterly different from dictation. Receiving a dictated message from an omniscient authority. I think inspiration comes very seldom in words. But divine inspiration isn't that kind of communication. Divine inspiration is, for example, to feel, for reasons that you can't really understand, that you love people. Divine inspiration is a wisdom which it's very difficult to put into words. 
like mystical experience. That's divine inspiration. And a person who writes out of that experience could be said to be divinely inspired. Or it might come through dreams, through archetypal messages from the collective unconscious through which the Holy Spirit could be said to work. Now, so therefore, everybody who receives divine inspiration, and I'm using that in a very loose way, you can mean anything you like by divine, that's your option. But anybody who receives it will express it within the limits of what language he knows. <laughs>